Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the sixth class. Um, you know, throughout the uh, the past several classes, you know, I'm mainly focusing on laws and regulations. Okay, um, I tried to explain what laws are. It's kind of boring, you know, to be honest. You know, because I haven't you know talked um, about the activity of an MLO just yet. But you know, um, talk discussing about the law, uh, tell you what the law is applied to, why the law was introduced. Right, I feel that it's more complicated. Okay, let let you know get you know why there's certain law that was uh, uh introduced right uh, throughout the years. And you know, guess what? You know, the the goal was that to protect the consumer. Okay, that that's the main goal. That's why you know they just keep introducing different kind of laws, right? Um, so you know, hopefully, probably today and maybe tomorrow or the next day, or within this week, I will try to wrap up the laws and then gonna go into the activities, okay? Because I wanna get the laws over and then we focus on the, the practicing and the activities of uh, an MLO, right? All right, so nothing new here. So today we're gonna to talk about, you know, the, the major laws that I discussed over the past few days are, you know, are the major one. Okay, thing that you need to know, okay? Um, because those, those laws are critical to the MLO activities as well as the real, you know, real estate activities, right? The next several laws are you know, minor laws, but they're also uh, important laws as well, um, especially the, um, the, the money laundering law, which is, you know, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit later, okay? So now, you know, last time we talked about, you know, the ECOA, right? Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which allow everybody to have an opportunity to use their credit to, you know, borrow a loan, a mortgage loan to buy a house, right? Um, today we're gonna continue with, you know, with, with that uh, by, you know, talking about the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is stand for FCRA, okay? F CRA is a federal law uh, in the U.S. It was in Act, you know, 1970, and um, subsequently it's also amended, you know, to re regulate the collection, dissemination, and use of consumer credit information. Meaning that it will try to, um, you know, regulate, you know, how companies collect your credit information, how to use them, and um, and how to, you know, share that kind of information. Right. So this law is amended to that um to the credit act so that um it will help the consumer and try to be you know fair and transparent okay you probably gonna you know kind of see this you know uh this law is was introduced in 1970 right um but somehow you know there's still a lot of issue with the the credit and um and lending right so that's why you know they keep introducing new laws to, uh, you know, you know to put in like a, you know to cover the loopholes that you know the system the financial system has, right? Um, so the FCRA is designed to protect the consumer right, like always. The all the laws is always protect consumer right, consumer you know for not being abusive, discrimination. Um, in th in this case, it's like protecting their right as well as the the privacy. Uh, with respect to the credit report and how they get collected, how they use it, and uh, what they need to disclose, and what you know something happened, um, you know what what they need they must do, okay, and um, you know this law is governed the activities of the credit reporting agencies, right, the credit companies, right, also the creditors, the one that lend you the money, um, entity that use the consumer credit reports like um you know broker um the lender right and um you know for various you know reasons and the, the key components are you know make sure that you know the information is accurate and private right it doesn't share to the people that you know doesn't have a need to know okay consumer access to the credit report so it's make the consumer um, you know, have an easy way to access the report, look at the report, and then if there's any discrepancy, you can report it and then the credit company is going to help you um, as a consumer to correct any, you know, deficiency on your report. 
because you know whatever wrong with your report will affect your credit score. And when it's affect your credit score, it will affect your ability to borrow a loan, right? So any discrepancy, any deficiencies um, you know, on the credit report, you know, you can fix it, right? Because this report is, uh, you know, it's cover all your credit history, you know, including the credit amount that you borrowed, that, that you used, that you pay back, you know. Um, and this actually partially a public record too, right? Because sometimes you allow a company to, you know, um, let's say you open an account, right? You open a credit card, you borrow a loan, right? And um, so they, they have access to your credit report unless if you remember the ECOA that you can actually freeze your credit report so that nobody can pull your report, right? So you have that power now you're under ECOA, right? But now the, um, the, the FCRA um, is actually the very early, you know, uh, you know, law that you know int it was introduced to help protecting the um, the consumer credit, and like I say, you know, dispute the resolution if you found any in in inaccuracy um, data on your report, you can work with the credit agency, and then you know clear that, okay, and they will help you, okay, and also for consent for credit inquiries, right, FEC. Um, Instead of FECA, I should say, you know, FCRA required that um, the creditors and other entity obtain the consumer consent before accessing their credit report. So let's say if a borrower want to, you know, get a pre-approval letter. Pre-approval letter is the letter say that, hey, a lender, take a look, or a broker, take a look at my credit uh, uh, history and tell me if I can get a pre-approval uh, to borrow five hundred thousand dollars to, you know, buy a six hundred thousand dollar home, right? And then you provide them uh, with the credit, um, uh, you know, uh, with the social security number, right? But before they pulling that, they are gonna send you a letter and say, okay, I'm agree for Miss uh, for Company ABC to pull my credit. Here's my signature, okay, and here's my social num, you know, social security number, okay. So you can send that you allow the creditor or whoever you know, helping you with, with pulling your the financial record, right? And you sign that letter and then they, they allow to do that. If they don't, right? If they don't have your signature and they pull it, they're violating, you know, at least the ECOA or uh, federal you know, regulated you know, law, okay? We're also talking about the adverse you know, action notice, right? If the lender reject your uh, your request for a loan, they have to tell you why. And anybody remember how many days that they have to send the uh, adverse notice? Within 30 days. Okay, they need to send it out within 30 days. Either you get a loan or a rejection, then you need to have a rejection letter or a denial letter, right? And then the realtor is gonna use that denial letter and send it over to escrow and the, the, the seller and say, hey, you know, I, don't, I cannot get a loan. So I'm back out. I get my earn, earnest money deposit back. Okay. And the FCRA is also trying to protect your identity, right? It's including several you know, provisions to help consumer address the identity theft, uh, such as like uh, placing fraud alert. Um, or sometimes, you know, around nowadays that you may have credit cards, right? Um, you can put in an alert, okay, if I spend over $500, right? give me a text or send me an email, right? Or even my credit balance is below $500, right? Give me a text, give me an email. And you can do the same thing on the credit agency too. If some major expenses, uh, any amount that you set up, right? They will send you a, a, a notice via text or email. Um, also that the, uh, the limitation on reporting uh, negative information um, the FCRA imposes time limitation on the reporting of certain negative information, such as late payment and charge off. Most negative information can only be reported seven years with some exceptions. So like, you know, um, if you're a good creditor, right, you, you know, manage your credit um, financial uh, history good, then probably you pay everything on time. But if you don't, Right. In case if you don't, they will report your mispayment 
to the credit bureau because that negative impact will will you know affect your credit score and you may have a 650 credit score you late payment three months they're going to drop it to 500 something right so those reporting um it's absolutely negative negatively impact your uh, credit history um duties of creditors and and uh, furnishers right the fcra places responsibility on the creditors an entity that furnished the information to CRAs um, to ensure the accuracy and completeness of the information they provide. They must also respond to consumer dispute and request information. Uh, just some repeated stuff, okay? Um, meaning, you know, creditors, uh, lender, bank, you know, they need to report in all the activity of your credit history and then also help you correct any issue that, you know, may sound, okay? Um, limited access to credit report. Access to consumer credit report is restricted to permissible purposes. Okay, anybody want to see your credit report? They have to have a purpose, and you allow them to look at it. Nobody can pull your credit report, um, you know, without your your consent or your knowledge. However, that I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about a hot pool, meaning that okay, there's a two type of pool: a soft pool and a hot pool. Hot pool is that they're going to pull entire history of your credit report, okay? And guess this, different company, different bank, different uh, lender, they pull the credit the reports differently, okay? There's several algorithms, there's several ways of how they pull the, the report, okay? But you know, the bottom line is that they want to access your uh, credit history. So they hot pull the credit, they pull out almost everything, okay? The soft pool is that, you know, um, when they do the hot pool, it's affect the the credit score. Okay, if you you if you pull like uh, during your uh, process of buying a home, you can pull like ten times. They only count one. Okay, but if for some reason you go out and you buy a car, you got a pull. You open a credit card, you got a pull. You open another credit card, you got a pull. You got three pulls of a hot pool, right? Your credit score will drop. Okay, and um. And the, the, the thing is that, you know, if you pull more than two times a year, you're going to see some effect into your credit uh, um, uh, score. And also that, you know, I, you know, I would suggest that you pull two times a year, right? Or you can open like, um, you can open like two different credit cards a year and that won't affect much to your credit score, right? Or you take two loans a year. You know, that, that won't affect much into your credit score. Obviously, if you take a, like a big loan, yeah, it will affect uh, definitely because your um, the DTI, your debt to income ratio, or your debt, you, you know, you accrue a, a lot of debts, then your credit score is going to drop. Okay. But the thing is that, you know, um, you, know, you, you, you know, there's certain limit that, you know, certain company, you know, like even your employer, right, can do your background check. Right, or even like if you want to apply for the MLO license, they're gonna do a hard pull, right? And um, and you have to give them the consent to pull that information. Okay. The uh, the FCRA Act protect like information to collect by consumer reporting agencies, such as credit bureaus. Uh, there are three credit bureaus. You know, yesterday I forgot the name, but later I'll tell you which those are. Okay. Um, medical information companies. Uh, tenant screening services, like you know, when somebody want to go rent a house, uh, an apartment, they have to provide you know a social security number so that the landlord, right, or the uh, property management company, can pull the credit history and see if they, uh, if they have a good credit score, or if they have a lot any debts, or if they have any you know bankruptcy or anything, okay. So that help them to uh, you know the the process of you know renting. Um, information in a consumer report cannot be provided to anyone who does not have a purpose specified in the act. Okay, we already you know talked about this. And who's got, uh, who's enforced this? CFPB again, right? Uh, and also FTC. FTC stands for Federal Trade Commission. Are both enforce the law, enforce the FCRA. Okay, and FCRA was uh, introduced in 1970. And it's Reg V, you know, Regulation V, okay? 
Uh, if you are you know, the first slide I have on you know, most of these law on there and I have the year name, the acronym, the year and the regulation. Uh, try to remember that because in the test, sometimes they say uh, Reg Z. You need to know what the Reg Z is. Reg V, what is that, right? Um, sometimes you know, regulation may have different law in it too, okay? So uh, according to the SEP Act, you know, it's required you know, the licensees uh, before engaging into the, you know, the business of MLO, um, they must first you know, register to the NMLS. You know, we know about this. Um, and it's just important to know your rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. You have a right to know what's in your life, right? What's in your file. Um, you have been a victim of you know, identity theft. You are entitled to ask the businesses, right? Like Target, Walmart, or any store that you believe your identity was, you know, was a, a victim of theft, right? Um, and then you ask them to, you know, that business for a copy of transaction record relating to the theft of your identity within 30 days, right? 30 days. You can ask them for that. Um, you have the right to ask for your credit score, right? If the if the um, the mortgage lender or mortgage broker um, run your credit, you can ask them for the uh, for the credit score. But guess what? You cannot ask for the credit report. Is that kind of strange? You actually pay for the credit report. You pay thirty nine dollars for a um, a loan officer to run your credit report, but you are not entitled to keep the report or to have the report, but you are entitled to get the credit score. The lender, the, um, the loan officer, if you ask, they will tell you your credit score. But guess what? When you ask, hey, can you send me my uh, credit report? <laughs> Some loan officer just send the whole report to the, uh, to the client. But guess what? The report, is the proprietary information or material belong to the credit agencies, not belong to the, not belong to the uh, the consumer, right? The consumer you now later in here, um, the consumer can run the credit report once a year for free from any credit agency, three credit agencies. Right, and then they can keep that report. However, during the process of loan origination, they pay $39 for the lender, for the loan officer, for the MLO to pull their credit uh, report, but they are not entitled to keep that report, but they entitled to get the credit score. So um, sometimes that, you know, during the process, you know, lender is gonna send them an email and say, hey, Mr. ABC, uh, we run your credit report and your experience uh, credit score is 700. Your Equifax credit score is uh, you know, 715. And your TransUnion's credit score is 690. Okay, they send you a letter and tell you that, but they don't send you the credit report. Even you ask, they're not gonna get, they're not entitled to give it to you because that is not their product to dis distribute. That is the product of the credit agencies. Okay, so keep that in mind. It may be on the test. Okay, they can ask for the credit score, but not the report. Okay, but guess what? I see a lot of loan officers give out the report too. <laughs> so be careful if you're an MLO, don't do that. Okay, um, let me see what else. Uh, okay, you have a right to dispute incomplete or inaccurate information on your report. I talked about that. Credit report agency obligated to correct or delete inaccurate incomplete or unverifiable information. So that's why there is a company uh, that actually help you or help the consumer, right? To correct the credit report issues, deficiencies, right? Um, and you know, they, they help you to bring up the credit score too. Right? And then also they give you strategies that you know, how you're gonna um, you know, pay off some debt, move some debt, correct some issues. And then your credit score like just you know, rocking you know, up to the 700 level. Reporting agency must not dis uh, disseminate outdated negative information. Okay, meaning that if you have a late payment eight years ago, they're not supposed to be keep that in their system. 
or uh, if you have a, um, a late payment, right? There is this certain time that you know that information is no longer stay on the report. Okay, you have a bankruptcy, five years, seven years, right? Okay, information in your file is limited to those with a valid need for it. Okay, so like like I mentioned earlier, there are three credit agencies: Equifax, Experience, and TransUnion. So these are the three largest credit reporting agencies. Uh, required by law, you know, to do everything in their power to actually protect and uh, share, you know, report any issues and things like that. So these credit agency, these credit agency have you know different ways of um, of calculating the credit score. Okay, um, so why they are you know have similar function? There are some different you know uh, differences among them, primarily in the data they collect and how they report it. Or should I say how they calculate it, or how and you know how they use the uh, the algorithm to calculate the credit score? Okay, uh, here are a couple of breakdown for different you know um, ways of how these um, information were collect and calculated. For Equifax, data collection including collect information on consumer credit history, including you know credit card accounts, loans, um, any credit related accounts. Right. They also gather public record data such as bankruptcies, tax lien, or judgments. Okay, bankruptcy, you know that, right? You own people with too much money, you don't have money to pay back, you file bankruptcy. Uh, tax lien, tax lien meaning that you own a property, you don't pay tax to the, uh, you know, to the county. Usually they allow, allow you like uh, five years. After that, they put you on the tax lien. Okay, but once you miss the tax, you're already you know in the bad shape. You know, even if you miss you know one year, is you already in a bad bad shape. So um, tax lien is that if you have the property tax that you don't pay. Okay, and guess what? After five years, the county can come to you and then foreclosure your home if you don't pay the tax. You know, the property tax. Judgment. What are the judgments? Judgment are lawsuits. Okay, somebody sue you. Uh, if there's a mechanical lien, okay, this is a new term, mechanical lien. Mechanical lien is that if you hire a contractor to renovate your home, but you don't pay that, that contractor money, or even in worst case, right, that contractor hire a subcontractor, but that contractor doesn't pay the subcontractor, the subcontractor can put a mechanical lien on your property, right? So be careful of who you're hiring to do your renovation. Okay, um, and so that that's what is called mechanical lien. Okay, um, you know also you know the uh, let's see you know public record judgment and all that right. Okay, scoring model, algorithm. Equifax use Equifax credit score, which is based on their proprietary scoring model, or should I say algorithm, right? This score may differ slightly from the credit score provided by other two agencies. Credit monitoring. Equifax offers credit monitoring services, including identity theft protection, uh, credit report alerts, or even freeze your credit, uh, you know, a file. Okay. Okay. Experience is the second, you know, credit agency. The way that they collect the data, is, uh, Experience gathered credit data from a wide range of sources, including credit card, loan, out of financial account. Okay, they also collect public you know, record data and information for rental payments. So you see that now, my right, experience is a little bit different than uh, than Equifax, right? They collect rental payment too. Okay, um, only if the landlord or a property management company reporting that data to the credit bureau, and they have that information. Scoring model experience provides the experience credit score which is based on their own scoring model. Like Equifax, the credit score may vary from score provided by other agencies. So right, right here, it doesn't say much how to calculate it because it's their proprietary um, you know, scoring model. Uh, free credit report access. It's really offer free access to credit report through their website. You can log onto experience.com and you can say, I would like to have uh, my credit report run. And guess what? You can get, run one credit report 
a year for all three agencies for free. But not only that, if you want to pay, you can run every three months. Okay, anytime that you want to run that you pay, you know, 39 bucks bucks that you that you can run. Okay, TransUnion data collection. Um, you know, TransUnion collect credit information, public record data, rental payment history. They also focus on alternative data sources such as rental history and non-traditional financial data. Non-traditional financial data. What does that mean? Meaning that, you know, sometimes that um that I don't know if they're able to tap into the uh, the private money, okay? Or if you you know if you if you borrow the money from a private lender, uh, and that private lender reporting the um, the the money that you borrow, or that lender put a lien on your property, okay? Because be, besides the mortgage company like big banks or you know lenders, right? Private lender or you know, just even can be mom and pop. Even myself, I can be a private money lender too. Okay, I lend money to somebody. I give that money to somebody, and I say, okay, you got a collateral your home, and then when I get that, you know, that notes, then I can go to the county and I put a lien on that property, and then you know, TransUnion can do that. They can run the public record and they pull that. You know, hey, you have another lien here beside the the lien from the uh, Bank of America. You have a lien to Mister Ho. Right, so things like that. They take that into account and they put that into their proprietary scoring model. So that's why you know, all three um, scores sometimes they they can match, but most of the time they they are different. Right, you may have different score for for different uh, agencies. Okay, also you know TransUnion uh, offer like identity theft protection, credit monitoring services to help consumers safeguard their credit profile. Okay, why FCRA, why Fair Credit Reporting Act? And it's what was introduced in 1970 for Regulation V. FCRA was introduced in the US for several important reasons aimed at regulating and improving credit reporting system, protecting consumer rights, promoting fairness, and in the industry, in the credit industry, it was in act in 1970 and has been amended multiple times since then, meaning they make several updates since then, right, to make it a, a better law. FCAs play a vital role in shaping the credit reporting landscape and promoting transparency and accountability within the credit industry. So that was the FCRA. Now we're talking about FACT Act or FACTA. Okay, fair and accurate credit transaction. Okay, this is the same thing, right? We have we have a ECOA, now we have the uh, FCRA, and now we have FACTA. Okay, F A C T A. Okay, they are you no, know, they both regulation, both but three regulation and three laws talking about the same thing, credit. Okay, see how this is different. Okay, this is different. They say that you no. Know, it's a federal law in the U.S. and it's in act in 2003. The fact uh, FCRA was you know in act in you know 1970, right? So this was newer. Um, and this is actually in act in 19 as an amendment to the FCRA, right? FCRA was introduced in 1970, and it's old. This new thing coming out, uh, electronic signature, for example, right? Because we we you know we in the modern world we keep growing technology keep introducing and things like keep introducing daily, so there need to be new law that coming out to adapt into the changing uh, modern technology and modern life, okay. Um, so, faculty, uh, actually the factor introduced several provision aimed at enhancing enhancing consumer rights and protection in the realm of credit reporting and identity theft protection. We didn't have identity theft back then, right? You know, it's really hard to get somebody uh, identity, you know, like social security number, right? There, there was, you know, I believe there, there, you know, there were, you know, cases that, you know, identity theft, but since the internet introduced in, you know, 2000, right? If not, you know, 1998 or something like that. Okay, so when when internet introduced and then identity theft you know, just keep exploding everywhere and nowadays it's like even worse. Okay, so then you act you know uh, 
the keep your um, inact. Um, so the fact that say that free annual credit report, I already mentioned this earlier, you can run one free credit report each year, but you can run as many as you want, as long as you pay. Okay, it's also provide identity theft pre prevention. Okay, um, so meaning that your credit uh, agency, uh, lenders, creditor, they need to enhance their security. They need to enhance their way of process to not sharing the information um, to secure their own system, their own platform, their own technology, their own servers and all that, okay, to prevent identity theft. But guess what? Hackers is, are professional. So you play professional against professional, okay? Um, also, this act says that you need to provide accuracy of credit reporting. Uh, it's to introduce you know, several measures to improve the accuracy of credit reporting. It requires the creditors and the furnisher of credit information to investigate correct and inaccuracy, uh, and report, you know, which is a report by the consumer, right? And then help to you know for uh, this dispute resolution. So if the consumer complain about their inaccuracy information on the credit report, you know, the uh, credit agency or the creditor or the bank need to help resolving that. Okay, risk-based pricing uh, notices. Lenders are required to provide risk-based pricing notices to consumers who receive less favorable term and interest rate based on information on the credit report. These notices inform consumer about the impact on credit history and their loan term. So risk-based pricing notices, meaning that, hey, uh, Mr. Ho, you are asking to borrow $500,000, but you are not qualified to get this loan or your rate is not as good because you have these deficiency on your report, okay? And these are the notices, okay? If you can correct these items, then maybe your credit score can go up and then you can qualify for the loan. Okay, so they have ways that they can identify issues um, to the credit, um, you know, history of a person, and um, and no, this this issue probably not like issue of deficiency, but this issue or the thing that can um, that the you know, let's say the borrower forgot to make a payment. Okay, the borrower, uh, you know, have like a, a credit payment, you know, too high. And there may be a way that you can lower that credit payment so that's going to help your credit score. Okay? Medical information protection. The act provides additional protection for medical information in consumer credit report, preventing the inclusion of medical debt on credit report until a 180-day waiting period has passed. So meaning that when you run a credit report, you don't see any debt okay, of, the, um, of any medical bill. But after 180 days, if you don't take care of that medical bill, it will appear on the credit report. Okay. So if on the test you see um, a question say factor, did factor include the medical, um, you know, information on the, um, you know, on the on the credit report? True or false? Right. So you need to know how to answer that question. Okay. The disposal of consumer information it mandates that businesses and individuals who maintain consumer information take you know, a measure to properly dispose sensitive data, reducing the risk of identity theft. So let's say us, right? We are MLO. We collect the consumer you know, social security number. You write on a piece of paper, right? Make sure that piece of paper needs to be teared out, burn it, throw it away, okay? Securely. Okay, so as an MLO, you you will receive a lot of uh, documents, information from the buyers for all the borrowers. Eventually, if you close that transaction, either you upload into your broker system or you delete them all. Even if you de delete them all, you need to purge them from the trash bin. Purge them means you permanently delete them. You don't leave it in the trash bin and then eventually somebody hack into your laptop or steal your laptop and they access to that information. Especially you are MLO, right? Nowadays, people are, you know, uh, targeting uh, escrow company, uh, brokerages, mortgage brokerages, and then even, you know, loan officer to collect a lot, you know, to steal data. Okay, so you got to be careful on how to dispose consumer information. Accuracy in mortgage lending, right? 
This act addresses accuracy and risk-based pricing in mortgage lending, helping to prevent abusive lending practices, meaning that, uh, hey, you know, you, you know, you have, your credit is too low, I'm going to give you 10% rate. But the thing is that, hey, he, you can correct that little thing and that's the issue gone away and my credit score is up, right? So there are way that, you know, the, this act is trying to help the, the consumer to get a better um, loan product. Okay, the act protect information collected by consumer reporting agencies such as credit bureau, medical information company, tenant screening services, okay? Uh, enforced by FCPB and F, you know, FTC, um, the FCRA rule is that one year credit report a year, uh, provide a risk-based pricing, preventing and mitigate identity theft, um, you know, enable consumer to place fraud alert on their credit file by, you know, set up the red flags, okay? Lenders are not allowed to send a proprietary credit report to the consumer, even if they are paid for it. Right. Remember, I, I talked about this earlier. The report belongs to the credit agency. The consumer pay the fee for the lender to view it. Okay, to view it only, not to print it out and hand it to you You're as a consumer. So you, you, you see the difference, right? Take a note of this. It may be on the test. Okay, why factor? Right, what fair and accurate credit transaction introduced in 2008, an amendment to the FCRA. Okay, FACTA was introduced to address critical issues related to identity theft prevention, credit report accuracy, and consumer rights. So, you know, like I say, you know, over the years, right, to the, uh, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2018, 2023. Right, new technology come out, new way of risk. So new law is introduced, just as simple as that. Okay, but this factor is about protecting identity theft mainly. And then, you know, we'll correct some credit um, um, uh, issues or discrepancies. Okay, uh, and like I said, this law was also, you know, introduced the enhancement of the transparency in lending and improve the accuracy of the credit reporting practices. Okay, that is it for majority of the credit stuff. Okay, so we have, we touched base with like at least three acts that relating to credit, equal opportunity credit, right? Um, you know, the FCRA and also the, uh, the FACTA. Now we come on to the, the next law, the next topic. Um, the next topic is the law that let's say BSA slash AML. What does it say? BSA slash AML is stand for Bank Sec uh, Secrecy Act and Anti Money Laundering. So now we're talking about money laundering. Okay. And guess what? When you heard about money laundering, you're going to have to put in your mind that money laundering. Why, why the government want to control the money laundering? Because they want to prevent terrorism, okay? They want to stop the money flow into the country or from person to person or from business to business, right? To support, you know, terrorism. So that is why they introduced this act, right? Back in 1970, again, right? You know, the other one is also 1970. So, this act referred to a set of laws, regulations, procedures in the U.S. that the financial institution and other cover entity must follow to detect and report, right, to prevent money laundering, terrorist financing, and other illicit financial activities. BSA AML, you know, which is stand for Bank Accuracy Act and Anti-Money Laundering. BSA AML compliance is crucial for safeguarding the integrity of the U.S. financial system to preventing criminal organizations from using the bank and other financial institutions to launder ill-gotten funds. But guess what? Since, 19, uh, since 2010 until now, we have a new way of, of money, crypto. 
blockchain, right? And so you see that technologies keep growing and that's new way of things that are uh, introduced. And then they're gonna be new law coming out. Right now, right, crypto, the main idea of crypto is that, you know, it's make like, you know, go away from traditional, you know, central bank. Now you can freely exchange crypto and stuff. But guess what? That's meaning that it can be easily, you know, do a money laundering, right? You can send crypto from across the, you know, the globe, right? So there gotta be new law coming out and then prevent, you know, um, your money laundering, you know, for crypto as well. So the uh, the BSA AML um, is uh, an act, you know, in 1970, uh, which include the, the BSA is a Bank Secrecy Act. Um, it was first major anti-money laundering law in the U.S. First major anti-money laundering law, right? It required financial institutions, including banks, credit union, certain non-bank financial institutions, uh, establishing and uh, maintaining program that you know designed it and detect report any suspicious transaction. Okay, so BSA say. All these banks or these financial institutions, you need to report any uh, illicit and illegal activities. That is what the law say. And AML, which is an anti anti money laundering, say anti money laundering refer to the broader set of measures and practices aiming at preventing the money laundering and financial um, and financing of terrorism. AML efforts, including the implementing customer due diligence. So meaning that um, you know, when you review the, the customer financial, right, um, and if you spot any you know anomaly, any unusual transaction, anything like that, you have to report that. And I have a, the next session uh, I'll talk about that. Okay, and um, conducting you know, risk assessment, establishing, reporting, and recording, keeping requirement. Okay, customer due diligence is a key component of the anti-money laundering compliance. It involves identifying and verifying the identity of the customers and understand the nature of their financial transaction. Let's say Mr. ABC want to go buy a house, right? Or Mr. ABC go into the bank and say, hey, uh, Bank of America, I want to wire $500,000 into this account. And guess what? This account eh, could be an escrow account. But this law say, that the bank need to do diligence by verifying if this is the case, is that Mr. ABC actually wiring the money to the escrow account to buy a property or not. So they have to do that diligence. They need to see um, a wiring instruction, okay? The wiring instruction is the, a letter including the, um, the, uh, the escrow company uh, name, telephone number, uh, bank account information, including routing and account you know, number, and uh, maybe address as well as um, you know telephone, probably email too. So before the bank wire that money request by the customer to uh, somewhere, or in this, in this case, to the escrow company, the bank pick up the phone and say, hey, um, escrow ABC, I got Mr. ABC here, want to send 500000 over to you. Is that correct? Okay, and even the bank had to actually look up that escrow company, see if that escrow company is legit. That escrow company also have to have a bank to hold the money too. So the the the, the originated bank got to go out and you know do some investigation by just make a couple of quick call, and then after everything is is uh, is clear and satisfied, they wire that money to the escrow company to complete the transaction of purchasing a property. Okay, and if you now if the bank or if the lender, or even if the loan officer, you know, we, we may maybe not you know, as professional as you know, the bank, right? But if we see any suspicious activity that we have to report it, and we have to report on a form or a report car, suspicious activity reporting, which just stand for SAR, okay? Financial institution need to uh, report to the FinCEN, FinCEN is what? Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Financial Crime Enforcement Network. Okay? So the financial institution, when they you know, see any suspicious activity, they need to file a report and then send it up to FinCEN. 
and let FinCEN you know deal with it, this and say, hey, do some investigation and see if this is uh, money laundering or if there's anything with fraud or any illicit activities, right? The SARS is actually helping the law enforcement agency to investigate and combat financial you know, crimes. Um, next, the currency transaction reporting. Financial institutions must file the CTRs for cash transaction exceeding a certain threshold, ten thousand dollars. Okay, so let's say um, I got my uh, I got my uh, commission check, right? I take a I did, you know I do the uh, electronic deposit, sixteen thousand dollars into my bank account. And it's 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 legit, but guess what? Behind the scene, my bank see that I have an amount ten thousand or higher. So now they have to compile my transaction into the currency transaction report, and then eventually send that off to the FinCEN and say, "Okay, this Mister Ho here just got sixteen thousand in this account. Uh, no, this is just a just a normal routine. I see something, you know." Big money get into his account. I just want to report it, okay? So, so I, you know, you can guess, right? The bank may be reporting, you know, hundred of thousand or, you know, uh, you no, know, ten of thousand of records, you know, each month to the the FinCEN and say, okay, these are all the activity because like people doing business, right? Now um, we do in business, we work and we got a paycheck. Or now, you know, if we work in the uh, uh, mortgage um, lend, um, you know, mortgage origination as well as you know. You know, real estate, we got a you know, big check coming in, right? But the bank job is just reporting them, make sure that nothing illegal, you know, that we do. Okay, so meaning that if somebody, or let's say if a buyer has mom and dad transfer 20K, 30K, 50K, 100K to, to the buyer's account, then guess what? The bank need to verify that. Say, where this money coming from? And um, I have a case that you know I just closed the uh, you know the the escrow you know several days ago. Um, the, the you know the buyer you know get a gift from her mother, okay, a gift, right? Because like when you buy a home, you can get gift from uh, from family, from mother, son, or, whoever, or sister, or brother, or whoever, okay. But the mother deposit a thirty thousand dollar check into her account, into her mother account, before wiring that money to the escrow company, and then the bank usually do deposit anything in a big amount, right? Sometimes it could take like seven to ten business days, right? Seven to ten business days. So she did deposit that thirty thousand dollar check into her, you know, her account. Her mom deposit. Put, you know, the check into her account. It took about 10 days, okay? Because the bank need to verify all this and you know, make sure the money is coming from the right source, not from like an, a known account, right? But eventually the money get in. But my point here is that you know, the bank is checking on that. They take a little bit longer time for bigger uh, money, okay? But this is also another scenario that you need to take into account that when your client need to deposit any big money into the account for the transaction of uh, an, an escrow, make sure they deposit that money early. Otherwise, the bank gonna take too long to make that money available. So that's what happened. Um, so we're supposed to close on the December 26th, but the, on December 26th, the money is not there yet. The bank say, it will be available on December 27th. And that what it, it did, they, you know, they take about, you know, seven to ten days. She deposit on the you know on the sixteen, I think, and then it's available on the twenty seven because they're holiday too, right? So be careful on this. If you're an MLO and you know that your client needs some money to deposit through a check or any means, that money need to get in there early. Otherwise, you're gonna miss the closing date. Okay, take that into account. Um, so we talk about the CTR currency transaction reporting enhanced. Due diligence, EDD, procedure involved in conducting more in-depth investigation and monitoring of high-risk uh, customers, right? EDD helped to identify and mitigate potential of risk associated with these customers, okay? Um, you know, such as you know, high-risk customers, including foreign, politically, 
exposed person or business at high risk in industry. Okay, money that you know transferred from international. Okay, so there's some due diligence that need to be done you know, within the financial institution. Okay, okay, reg regulatory oversight. Okay, this law is the, the law that you know kind of look over as a whole, reporting, uh, you know, uh, collecting, reporting, and and monitoring. Okay, uh, penalty and enforcement. Any non-compliant with the BSA AML, okay, regulation can result in significant penalty, fine, regulation, you no, know, a reputational damage to the financial institution. Additionally, individual involved in the money laundering and other financial crime can be faced criminal prosecution and may be put in jail, including fine. Okay, so the BA, the BSA AML, majority of the time, is applicable to the financial institution to monitor and reporting any suspicious activity. Okay, um, you know, keep this in mind. When you hear about BSA AML, is the money laundering and the bank or financial institution have the majority role in, you know, uh, tracking, okay? So BSA provide like a, a foundation for, to promote a financial transparency, deter and detect who seek to misuse the US financial system to launder, you know, for criminal, you know, criminal uh, proceed, financial terrorist act, or more move fund or other illicit purposes. Uh, FinCEN administer the BSA and serve as a U.S. financial intelligence unit. Okay, laws and regulation, key laws or and regulation that pertain you know, to FDIC supervised institution. Note that other laws and regulation also may apply. Okay, yeah, like I said, all, all this stuff is like just a summary, right? Recording, reporting uh, for any financial institution, monitoring program, you know, file the suspicious activity report. Uh, here is something important here. Bank detect a known or suspected criminal violation of the federal law or a suspicious transaction related to money laundering activity or a violation of the BSA no later than 30 days after the initial detection. Okay, and all the records need to be kept for five years. Okay, under the BSA, uh, financial institutions are required to assist U.S. government agencies in detecting and preventing money laundering and keep the record, cash purchases, okay? Now, you have a case that a, a buyer go buy a property paying cash, right? And then the financial institution who hold the cash need to know where this money goes, okay? So, and they have to report that. Okay, hey, this person you know just take nine hundred thousand dollars out and buy and buy a property. Okay, the bank need to report that to the uh, the FinCEN. Okay, uh, file report of cash transaction exceeding ten grand. Okay, so you know that if you move your money a lot more than ten grand, knowing that there's some activity behind the scene happening too, right? And report any suspicious activity. Uh, mainly, you know, for national security, money laundering, and terrorism. Financing posts significant threats to the national security. Okay, regulatory oversight. I already mentioned this. Now there got to be somebody that enforce, observe, monitor, track, and then you know, um, and like I repeat it again, enforce, right, and make sure everybody is complying. Um, financial system integrity, right? This law makes sure that you know the money that's floating around in the financial uh, market. It's actually good money, not bad money. Okay, global coordination, right? Um, there are international organizations and governments also emphasize the importance of anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing efforts. BSA and AML regulation align with the global standards, facilitating international cooperation in identifying and combating financial crime. So this this law actually is cooperating um, throughout the globe. Okay, for many, many different countries. Oh, well, guess what? We're done. Am I on time? Oh, thank you. I promise you that I'm not gonna take a longer than, than an hour this time. Okay? Uh, because I don't give a lot of example this time. Uh, so we have five minutes. Anybody have any any question? Any question? 
So stick with me for a few more days on the law, and then I'm going to go directly into the activity because I want to get the law out of the way first, and then um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll you know I'll talk about all the activity, and it's going to be more interesting stuff. But guess what? You need to understand this law first and foremost. You need to pass the test, and there's a lot of laws in the in the test, and sometimes this law you need to understand it what it is, right? Because like the question may be tricky. Right. Yeah. So if you don't know the law, you're gonna miss the uh, you know the, the uh, answer a uh, uh, you know, question, and then you can fail. I don't want you to fail. I want you to get eighty seven correct so that you can pass. Okay, Joe. Any question? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go. Um, yeah. Uh, someone in the chat box. Uh, want uh, the slide deck? Want to oh, upload the so slide deck? I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I forgot to drop in the slide deck for you guys. Okay, yeah. All right. Slide deck on my way. There you go. Yeah, and uh, also you, you you mentioned uh, as a loan officer, we got to connect with the real estate agent. But uh, as I know, right, uh, if the client want to um, to buy a house, they got to get the um, pre-qualified letter first, right? Pre-approval letter. Oh yeah, pre-approval letter first. And then reach out to um the agent to to go um see the house, but uh, so in in that case, the client get to um the loan officer first, right? So we the people introduce we the people um give the client to uh to the agent, realtor. yeah, to the realtor. Okay. Is that is that the question you say that yeah. is that the mo the 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 first uh defense or the first you know uh thing that you know the the, the consumer are gonna come first before yeah. you know go buying a property. Yeah. That that's supposed to be the way, but it's not. Okay. It's supposed to be that first thing first, you need to get be you know you have to make sure that you have the financial um stability and able to you know to borrow, get approval and then go find an agent to go and look for a house and then buy a house. But that is not the case. Guess what? The whole thing is buying a house. And when you say buying a house, the consumer probably in the back of you know, his or her mind say, oh, I may qualify, okay? Now they wanna look at the house first. So in order for them to look at the house first, they have to have an agent, a realtor, right? So they kind of go opposite, right? But most, most of the agents say, hey, before we take you out to see the house, are you approved? Okay? Because you need to be pre-approved. Otherwise, I, you're going to waste my time. Okay? But trust me, more than 80% that whoever come to the realtor already know that they are qualified. Okay? Because they, you know, they go online. Nowadays, they go online, they Google, and they, they, they can figure it out. They say, I have money. And they know that there are certain ways, there's certain uh, loan program, loan products that they can get to make sure, you know, to get them qualified to buy a home, right? So that means that they just want to make sure that they, they like the home first, okay? And when they do that, the realtor may be nice enough, take them to see one or two house, but eventually the realtor one, hey, you need to show me the pre-approval letter. Me, and then at that time, the, you know, at that time, the realtor may refer this client that he sells doesn't have a pre-approval letter to a loan officer, right? So like, like I told you, majority of the time, 80% of the time, 80%, you know, I just want to pick a higher number. I don't want to put up a 100%, but the higher number are the realtor refer the, the, the borrower or the buyer to the loan officer. That. That is in the reverse way. Instead of, you know, the loan officer, you know, refer the buyer to, uh, you know, to the uh, the realtor. It it happens, you know, you know, in some cases, but majority of the time, right? Buyers always want to see the home first. Nowadays, they can go on to Zillow, Redfin, you know, Trulia to look at for properties, and they ask, "Hey, uh, Mr. Realtor, can you take me to see this home?" Right? The realtor, I said, "Okay, I'll take you. Go take uh, take a look at the open house." Also talking about open house, right? Nowadays, they can just walk right into the open house. 
They don't even need a realtor. But eventually they know the benefit of having a realtor, right? So they go see open house, they don't even have a pre-approval letter, right? And then now they like that house, they talk to a realtor, the realtor say, okay, I know somebody do a loan, let me refer you to that person, help you with the pre-approval letter. Once you get the pre-approval letter, you already view the property, but right now is the time that we would put in an offer. So we will write that and ask the loan officer, can you send me the pre-approval letter? Okay, I will include the pre-approval letter, a proof of funds. What is the proof of funds? Proof of funds are the bank statement showing that, okay, I'm gonna down $100,000. Make sure the statement uh, add up to 100,000 or more. Okay, and then you include the offer, the pre-approval letter, bank statement, send it off to the, uh, the listing agent, right? The listing agent collect a bunch of you know, off offers. Yeah, you know, there's a bunch of offers. And then present that to the seller. Seller say, okay, I'm gonna pick this guy, okay? And then the seller accept Mr. A uh, offer. Now the, you know, the listing agent gonna contact an escrow company to open an escrow. Right, the loan officer say, okay, now we got an, uh, um, an open escrow. Give me the, the contract, okay? The contract, which is the offer, right? And then you fill out this loan application. And then we're gonna um, do thorough, put a check on you, right? Your employment and all that. And then, you know, we're gonna, within three days of the application, we're gonna send you a loan estimate, which is an LE. Then we move forward with the appraiser, right? On this side, loan um, uh, uh, realtor, like do inspection. Appraiser came back, uh, appraisal report came back good. Inspection report, you know, uh, come back good. We move forward with the loan. The lender, the underwriter approved the loan. We got a CTC, a clear to close. Okay, once we get the clear to close, right? Then we sign the loan doc. We get the loan doc out. The, the notary is gonna come and then you know help the buyers you know to sign the, the loan doc and also you know some document for title transfer, right? And also the same thing on the the seller side. And then um, you know we come into the close, we close the escrow, the buyer, the borrower get the new home. Okay, so like I say, majority of the time, realtors are the one that get the client to the MLO. So that's why your funnel of, of having the realtor. It's a must-have. That's how you make money. That's how you get your commission. Because you know you you have to do your own marketing too, right? But trust me, majority of the time is that you get from uh, from the uh, from a realtor. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. So if you don't have any question. I'll see you for tomorrow class. Okay, have a good night. Ciao. Have a good night. Have a good night.